Good morning. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 16. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through, 7, uh, 10 through 16. And unto the married I command yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest, to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an, an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Amen. Thank you, Charlie. There'll be an additional reading if you want to uh, open your scriptures also to Matthew chapter 19. So we'll be uh, briefly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to establish the context, and then we'll uh, defer over to Matthew chapter 19, and I'll give you the scripture reference when we get there. Let's uh, begin this morning with asking God's blessing on his holy inspired word. And fathers, we are here uh, to receive the words of eternal life, Words that you uh, saw fit to have the Apostle pen so that they would be preached on this very moment here today. The only way that we can really understand them is by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us to discipline our minds, to hear, and then to be able to sort out, to lay aside all the affairs of life, just give immediate attention to the Scriptures. And might he also teach us, shed light upon these Scriptures to instruct us in the ways of life, to build our marriages to be on solid ground and solid rocks, to be uh, that which would give glory and honor to your name. Thank you, Father, that we have freedom to liberty, to listen, to preach, to assemble, and we want to be found most faithful in these uh, wonderful freedoms that we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, sometime back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as we started our study, and uh, the one verse by verse, we are um, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, and one of the areas that we find ourselves is on those pressing issues of uh, divorce and marriage, divorce and remarriage. Paul's dealing with the Corinthian church, and there were some uh, prevalent practices in that day, of which we'll address later on. We come to verse 10 in our study, and there we find where he says, To the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. So Paul introduces to us in his uh, uh, writings to the Corinthian church, letters that were written pertaining to, and questions about, and then the question about uh, the divorce, and so forth came uh, immediately to his attention, and he wants to speak to that subject. At the same time, as we do this, and as we travel and we walk slowly through this book, we, we get into issues that uh, are of, of concern, issues that are of interest. I think the subject of uh, divorce and remarriage probably ranks up with a, the preaching of prophecy. If you want to have a large gathering of people at your church, you have a prophecy conference, everybody wants to know about future things. If you want to have a large gathering in your church, you're going to have a seminar in divorce and remarriage. But in both of those, the emphasis and the interest is in the end result. Where can we go from here? What's next? And uh, meanwhile, uh, for the other 360 days that are happening, uh, the pressing issue is how do we live prior to our removal from this earth? The rapture, the kingdom of God, and eternity and heaven? How do we live in the meanwhile? Do the Bible, does the Bible have anything to say about that? That question all the time is not asked. We're more interested in where we're going. Likewise, when it comes to the subject of uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, it oftentimes boils down to the pressing issue is, 
Ev is it allowed? Where's the exception clause? How does that fit into the culture in which we live today? Uh, is divorce permissible? Does God have anything to say about it? And the, almost to the point where I think if it were at all possible, we would actually develop courses in our colleges that would be theological lawyers to be able to address some of these perplexing issues in order to answer uh, the, the matters that, and the, uh, the situations that are in churches today. Now, eventually, because we are looking at passages of scriptures that speak plainly on the subject, we have to be able to give an answer on the can I, what if, and when, and what does God have to say. All of these things must be addressed. But I propose to you that before we get into uh, the, those, those answers and study that element of divorce and remarriage, let's look at the word marriage. In other words, if enough attention were given to the subject of marriage, there would be less need for sermons and study on the subject of divorce and remarriage. Now, that's asking for a utopia. This problem has existed from the Old Testament days and the days of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 24. So we're not going to fix a lifelong problem in humanity in not in this church, not by this preacher, not in any church. We're not going to fix it in one day. But we can go back to the basics. We can go back to the original template. We can go back to God's original design and purpose of marriage. And once that is embedded in our minds, so and that becomes our focal point, I believe then there will be less need to concern ourselves with the divorce and remarriage because the focus is going to be right where it belongs on magnifying God, glorifying God, the supremacy of marriage in the sight of God and humanity. And that's where we will be here today and for the next several weeks and moving then in our, in our, into the subject area of divorce and remarriage itself. Meanwhile, let me say this, because I will be talking about and speaking, preaching from the Word of God on subjects such as marriage, divorce, and remarriage, some of which you may have gone through, some of which may be even thought about. That does not necessarily mean that what, I, what is the Bible has to say, uh, I don't want you to come across as someone that doesn't care, on loving, or indicting people for divorce in the history of their life. It is not my job, it's not my responsibility, I'm not here to uh, uh, reinvent guilt in the life of anybody that has gone through this. My intention in these series of sermons is to prevent it from ever happening again, or at least doing all that we can to at least abate the issue and put the focus where it really belongs in building strong biblical marriages. So please uh, don't confuse the author of the word with the speaker at the pulpit. Uh, if, if God's word plainly makes a statement uh, that God hates divorce and he, he doesn't mince the words about it and I share that with God doesn't mean that either one of us, God or myself, look down upon the divorced individuals or the divorcees. That's not at all. So we, I just wanted to get uh, the, that clear so that there's not any misunderstanding that anybody walks out here and says, this church and that pastor has a very little heart for people that have gone through some of the uh, pressures and the, and the pains of divorce. I understand that. That is not where I'm at. But we do have to go to Matthew chapter 19 in order to set the context for what we're dealing with today. To begin with, the title being The Supremacy of Marriage. And I've been introduced in this sense that in the 21st century view of marriage is almost as unintelligible to the world that we live in as it was in the days of Jesus. For people to be able to grasp and intelligently comprehend what God had in mind for marriage. And we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 19. And beginning of verse 3, And the Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his life for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that which was made at the beginning, made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall me leave, uh, leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. 
Wherefore, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined to set her, uh, together, let no man put asunder. They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered or allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Listen to their answer. And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever married her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so, it is not good to marry. Now what had just happened is they, they asked the question, their understanding and their rendition of the divorcement clause that Moses gave. And it was quite liberal. And they also even embellished it with a little bit more liberality. To the point, we'll look at some of this in greater detail later on, uh, that for whatever the reason might be, a man could dismiss his wife. Burn the toast, not look pretty, aging out, he could dismiss her. And so, that was the... This was going on. Moses sets in some regulations to control this thing. The Pharisees come to Jesus, and they say, okay, what is your take on this? And Jesus simply skips over Moses, goes back to Genesis, and says, from the beginning, it was not so. And he takes them to Genesis chapter 2, 23, 24, and 25, and establishes the fact that marriage was a God-ordained institution. God presented the first bride. God uh, presented the first wedding vows, and God put marriage together, and all in total, it was meant to be forever, till death do us part. Now, when the Pharisees hear this, because Jesus is not entertaining their liberal view of marriage and divorce for any cause or any reason, their conclusion, their conclusion is that apparently marriage is not a good idea. If you're going to make this such a binding agreement, And if I have to enter into a a, a wedding vows and a marriage ceremony without a possible way of escape, this is not a good idea. In other words, the way of thinking was, this is too strenuous, it's too treacherous, there is no permanence, we don't buy that, it cannot be a good thing. And I oftentimes wonder, is that where the 21st century America is today? Not just America in general, but we focus on churches I wonder if that's where it's at. The idea of something that is permanent versus a paper document. Something that Jesus meant to be rock solid as opposed to those things which are built upon sand. A non-committed society in which we live in. Another way to look at it, if you remember when Moses came down off the mount with Joshua in Exodus chapter 32, and uh, Joshua hears the sound, he says, I hear the sound of war. Moses says, I hear the sound of party. And when they get down, they find that they build a golden calf. And Moses then calls who is on the Lord's side, who will help stand up, stand for the Lord, every man to draw his sword and destroy his neighbor, his brother, his sister, his cousins, whoever it is that has now defiled the name of God. And the Levites stepped across the line. I wonder today if the challenge were set before us in that sense, how many would cross the line? definitive action? Or would it be something like, well, let me think about this. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't you being a little bit brash about this? Aren't we being like too uh, hard? Shouldn't we take into consideration that uh, here are some circumstances, Moses, you've been gone a couple of days. Shouldn't we think this through before we take such decisive action? The language of a non-committed society, negotiation, rhetoric, And when it comes to that of marriage, it's pretty much the same thing. John Piper makes this observation on this particular text. He says, uh, if if that was the case back then with the sober Jewish world in which they lived, how much more will the magnificence of marriage in the mind of God seem unintelligible to the world we live in? Where the main idol is self, Its main doctrine is autonomy. Its central act of worship is being entertained. 
its two main shrines, or the television and the cinema, its most sacred genuflection is the uninhibited acts of sexual intercourse, such a culture will find the glory of marriage and the mind of Jesus virtually unintelligible. Jesus very likely say to us today, when he had finished opening the mystery of the marriage to us, for us, the same thing he said in his day, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. Let the one who is able to receive it, receive it. Is that where we are at? The whole possibility of an indissolvable, never to be broken marital relationship. And Jesus makes it quite clear that by God's design, God's intent, this is where it is. Our main text is actually 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 16, as we go through this, because it does speak to the subject of divorce and remarriage. But we also are arrested by Paul's words in verse 10. To this I say, as he states it, and unto the married I command, not I, but the Lord. So Paul is now deferring his answer to the divorce question posed by the Corinthian church. He defers his answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. He also implies that he has an answer which on another subject, so it's I and the Lord, both are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul is not going to say something that uh, is against or militates against the words of Jesus. He's simply saying, let's go back to what Jesus had to say on the subject of whether or not divorce is permissible. And so we do the same thing. Let us go back and figure out what is going on here. And the focus is going to be on the supremacy of marriage. We have to. We have to because we, are we in any kind of shock? Are we disturbed by the news of divorce? Is there a, a great joy and an excitement about uh, two lives coming together or both have both of them been basically reduced to common ordinary events? That there's no more grandness and glory to a wedding because we anticipate with the question, well, I don't know how long that's going to last. And then when divorce papers are issued out anymore, you do it online, pay four to $600 to a local um, power of attorney or what have you, and it's, it's all done. Here's a, a simple illustration by what I mean about things that are really not important anymore, and, and, and weddings and uh, divorce are just so commonplace that we, we just lose sight of it. While we were in, with the seniors in Georgia, on our way back, they had some leftover cold goods, so I went into Walmart and bought a cooler chest. And I'm carrying the cooler chest. I had, as my habit is, I put the receipt in my wallet, walk out the door, and here stands a Walmart employee. She looked rather important, wore a walk -a walkie-talkie on her shoulder and, and had some things hanging off of her waist, and I thought it was a security officer, so I stopped. Put the cooler chest down, reached out, took the receipt on my wallet, and the lady says, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm buying this cooler chest, and I wanted to show you my proof of purchase. She goes, well, that's not necessary. I said, you've got to be kidding me. That's where I come from. Uh, we have police departments built in Walmart, and we have security that stands at the door, and they check what you buy. You don't just walk out the door. She goes, oh, no, no, you just go on. Well, you're fine. And I thought, that's, that's where we're at today. For them, the idea of there are no incidents, everybody is honest, there, there's nothing really to be concerned about either way. And, and sometimes I wonder if marriage and divorce is just like that. It's really a virtually no concern. It's just something that it's ordinary. And it, it does not raise any alarms at all in our mind. So what is the answer to that? I think the answer to it is the fact that we recognize that in the mind of God, marriage has always held a supreme place in his heart. And, there's, and, there's a, and there are reasons for that. So I just want to give you this morning three thoughts that have to do with a high view of marriage. First is this, the higher my view of marriage the greater will be my resolve to preserve the permanence of my marriage. The greater my view of marriage, the greater will be my resolve
to preserve the permanence of my marriage. In other words, if we hold a high standard and we want to live up to that standard, we put marriage on the throne where it rightly belongs above everything else, and we see that as uh, instituted by God, owned by God for God's glory and for the sake of the kingdom and for the image that it portrays. We hold it up there where it belongs. We value it highly. We have a high view of it. It will have an impact on how we act, how we live, what we are going to do to preserve the integrity and the beauty and the glory and the honor of the marriage relationship because there's something behind it. It's not just a love affair. It's not just a, a, an exercise in the promise of living happily ever after. It's not that. It's instituted because it is going to show the world and portray in, in a dramatized way the relationship of a loving graceful, forgiving God with a sinful people. How God can have a a covenant relationship and keep people and still love them regardless of the rebellion. Hold them accountable, but maintain the relationship. And weddings and marriages are designed for the purpose of portraying and dramatizing this relationship of the divine with the human. And when that is interrupted, when we present the, the high prospect that it's something that, that can be revoked, dissolved, annulled, divorced, separated, there's, it backfeeds that by implication, then that's the same thing that God can do to us. When you think about it in terms of salvation, is there any hope in being saved? Because if marital relationships are designed the permanent relationship between God and man redeemed, and if we are going to forfeit that permanence by substituting it with some kind of prenuptial agreement and making it a temporary or for whatever cause might be, if we're going to do all of that, then we are no longer demonstrating the true model and the true example of what God intended, the permanence of a wedding, because it's a demonstration and, and a portrayal of the security that we have in Christ, the permanence of his covenant relationship, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. One way that I might illustrate it, uh, since uh, I like tools, I don't have as much use for them as I used to, but you're going to buy quality tools. You own a garage, the snap-on dealer shows up. And he's got some tools that you break it, they warranty it, they'll replace it. Craftsman, uh, socket sets, you don't buy one, you buy the kit. That's just what we do. You lose one, you're going to pay a quarter of the price for a whole kit, so we end up with three or four of them. But we buy the Craftsman tools because they are very, very sturdy and strong. You go to the local Walmart, you go to a uh, uh, pharmacy of some sort, sometimes they'll have a little bin, 99 cents, wrench, screwdriver, hammer. You give a test you take one of those little wrenches that are a socket set that you can buy for 99 cents or $1.99. You try taking the lug nut off of a tire, and the handle is going to break. But if you take a snap-on tool or a craftsman tool that is designed to withstand that kind of torque, it will handle it. Now, when you set them up on the table, both of them will look shiny and pretty. You'll not be able to know the difference. Without a name, you'll not be able to know the difference. And sometimes our weddings can be just like that. Our marriages can be just like that. Both of them on the surface can look very beautiful. But when it comes to the real test, the real exercise of strength, is it going to withstand the pressure? Then the 99-cent bail-me-out wedding is going to break and fall apart. And you wouldn't know it until the pressure was applied to it. So when we talk about marriage and we see, we understand that God has always had us use the illustration of marriage throughout the history of humanity with Israel. He saw Israel as his, as his bride. He saw himself in a marital relationship, a covenant relationship with Israel. He finds when you read about the church, we are what? The bride of Christ. And then we have the great wedding feast that is going to take place. Every believer is 
part of a marital relationship with Jesus Christ. And in that, you have the word promise, you have reconciliation, you have forgiveness, you have grace, you have love. In 2 Corinthians, if you'll turn there in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, Paul describes this language in, in, in such endearing terms of the fact of how much uh, the, the wedding, the marriage relationship Meant, I have treated you as one that is a spouse to Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen to the language that we have here in this passage. He says, would to God that you would bear with me, at least give some time to what I have to say. I want to express my heart and bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, espoused to one husband. The language, the language speaks of how God uses the marriage to demonstrate and clarify the relationship of God with the church. Without going to the passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 32, you see the same emphasis. The mystery, this is a great mystery, Paul writes, of how Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and how husbands likewise should sacrifice and surrender and give to their wives and present them as chaste virgins before the Lord, cleansed that mystery of godliness, that mystery of the marriage and the relationship with Christ and the church is, is uh, made substance in the way that we live our lives as husbands and wives. You see... Even though personal happiness and pleasure perhaps are residual benefits of a marriage, it is not the intention or God's original design. It is for companionship. It is not good for man to be alone. But in all the references, many references, I may put it this way, where Jesus speaks on the subject of marriage, Paul speaks on the subject of marriage, they always go back to Genesis chapter 2 because that was the high water mark. That was the high mark. That was the glorious episode in the history of humanity to the very beginning, the first wedding that was ever performed. The higher my view of marriage, the greater my resolve will be to preserve the permanence of the marriage relationship. Secondly, the higher my view of marriage, the greater will be the exercise of that resolve. So we have a high view of marriage and we have a resolve to do it. What are we going to do in the meanwhile to make sure that this happens. As John Owen says, it's one thing to know that uh, there must be the mortification of sin as something else entirely to be able to exercise and to put into practice the means and the ways that which God has set forth to put sin to death in our life. So it's one thing to know that it's there. It's something entirely different to know that there are some things that I'm held accountable for. Likewise in a wedding, likewise in a marriage. If we have... We know what it is. It's supposed to be permanent. But what are we going to do to maintain it? So the first thing I would recommend is premarital counseling. We want to be able to enter into a marital relationship with a good background of what to expect. But I wonder sometime, because people have historically in the past, we are, we are very interested in getting married. I said, well, I'm very interested in that we have premarital counseling first. You see, fish born in the water by nature know how to swim. Birds born in the nest by nature know how to fly. Nobody had to teach them. They learn it by trial and error, but the fish always figures out a way to breathe, and the bird always figures out a way to fly, except for the local cat. Different story altogether. But nevertheless, it comes by nature. Wedding, marriage, is not something that is natural. You got to understand, we enter into a cursed situation right from the beginning. We go back to Genesis chapter 2, and right immediately after the fall, God levies a curse against the wife. She's going to have pain in childbearing. For Adam, the soil, the earth is cursed. You're going to sweat, you're going to work hard, and it's going to rebel against your tending to the soil. And for your marital relationship, she's always going to want to have rule over you. And you're going to have to do what you can to trim her wings and keep her in place. And there's going to be this continual conflict. So every marriage relationship, every wedding is an introduction 
into the sphere of a cursed relationship. Now, that sounds depressing, doesn't it? Now, maybe that renders the response that it's not good to get married. Well, the solution to that is, number one, acknowledge the fact that, yes, and this is premarital counseling, let me tell you something, two sinners are going to come into the same roof, and you're going to have conflict of interest. How about if we resolve those conflicts of interest today? And how about if we set forth a methodology, an understanding of how to communicate, how to demonstrate patience and grace. You see, it's weddings and trying to preserve with resolve is, is like walking through a, a, a field of landmines. I, you should look at pictures of France and Italy, farmland, just beautiful, serene, nice green grass. World War II, you would not dare just go running, walking across that same field. There were hidden landmines. And every soldier would be instructed how to carefully traverse that acreage for the preservation of his own life. Entering into marital relationship is also entering into a field of landmines. But not to frighten us, but how to do, disarm them. And what are we supposed to do? So it's not a natural thing, wedding, marriage. We don't know, actually naturally know how we're supposed to get along. Then you have the practice of love. So in premarital counseling, let's learn how to love. Learning in practical, demonstrable ways in which concept and ideas are passed on as reality and substance. And again, the tool illustration. Uh, I've had many men say in, in the history of counseling after they've, they're just not owning up to their husband's responsibility, but I really do love my wife. That's like saying, well, I really have a 99-cent tool, but it ain't worth anything. And neither is your love because it fails to be able to exercise and do what biblical love asks of you, and commands you to do. And then when it comes to the exercise, not only is there premarital counseling and the practice of love, but there is the prevention of division. The prevention of division, that knowing where the problem areas are and being able to uh, be careful not to do those things that are going to raise and present a contest. And here again, Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in, in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who is a, and then he describes himself. He laid aside all his glory and his honor, took upon him the clothing of the servant. Humanity, clothed as a servant, was obedient even to the point of death. A total surrender to the Father's will. And so when this is the mindset that a husband and a ha wife have toward each other, they're on the pathway to preventing division, which is typically comes out of personal uh, happiness and a desire and pride and unforgiving spirits and grudges or having it my way or no way and laying down alternatives rather than practicing grace, patience, and forgiveness. Things need to be done and we have to be prepared to be blindsided and we have to be prepared for those events or something that might come in and, 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 uh, and uh, br begin to break down the walls. We've got to be quick to be able to make repairs. Sometimes I wonder and is if we're like the, the story of Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty was not a big fat egg that sat on a wall. In 1648, when the loyalists were attempting to maintain the, the city of Colchester in England during the uh, Civil War in England, the, parla uh, the parliamentists had waged a war, 11-day siege against the city. And they placed a huge cannon on, a, on the city wall right next to St. Mary's Church. The name of this cannon was Humpty Dumpty. And when the parliamentarians uh, launched a volley of shots, it hit the wall beneath the cannon. The cannon was so heavy that the wall crumbled and fell down. And there goes the cannon. And as the little nursery rhyme goes, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty to back together again. 
The problem was all the king's horses and all the king's men could not take the heavy cannon and put it back up on a high wall to another strategic location. In other words, they assumed that the location of the cannon and its ability to do devastating destruction to the impending enemy was in a safe and secure place. But they did not expect that one cannonball shot would destroy its foundation and cause it to fall and its replacement just could not happen. The preservation of a marriage means that we have to be aware of the fact that there will be a volley of cannonballs from our adversary, the devil that has come in and wants to destroy and to break down marital relationships. And so when we have a high view of marriage and we see it as something that is supreme in the eyes of God and we, and we make it our goal because of that, then we consider premarital counseling or we consider marital counseling, we practice love and we do what is necessary for the prevention of of divisions. And the third and final thought is this, the higher my view of marriage, the greater will be my hatred toward divorce. This is where we have the evidence of two extremes. When we have a high view of marriage and how God cherishes it, how it's a display of his relationship between himself and humanity, the church, Israel, that in his terms, it's an irrevocable covenant relationship. And he's a promise keeper. And the practice of marital relationships exalts that, demonstrates that to, the, to an unsaved world and to one another's believers. There's a connection there. It is not dismembered from the Scripture. And when we see that, we cherish it, and we love it, we want to preserve it, and we're going to exercise the resolve to protect it because we have such a high view then a growing out of that is going to be a hatred, a despising of the very idea of divorce. Not because of its pain, but because of the blemish that it puts on the beautiful portrait that God has set forth on the canvas of marriage. So therefore, it should be within our hearts the very hate, the very idea, and the possibility. Even though there are those situations that it is just cannot be stopped, it cannot be changed. You may have a situation where you're the last one ever to want to sign the documents, and you have no choice. Laws today force the issue. But I think to illustrate it would be like this. There are some things I just hate doing, and it may be necessary. And I'm not promoting or saying that sometimes divorce is necessary. I'm saying that the Bible recognizes that it does happen. But in that, perhaps in that area of necessity, where is, it, is the hatred? The hatred has to come before it. So we have a, 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 a hatred that grows toward divorce at the beginning because of the exaltation of marriage itself. And when that time comes, we hate it but it's happening, and maybe it just had to be. How do we look at that? Well, most of you know I'm, I, I love animals. I love dogs. And when they begin to get old and blind and decrepit, and, and you just know they, see, they can still hear you, and there's this affection and all that stuff, you know that finally the day has come. You take them to the vet, and they do the lethal injection. You hate it! but you know it has to be done. There are some things in life that we do not want at all to happen, but the inevitable takes place. And so there is this, you'll hear yourself, I hate doing this, but that's the way it is, it's got to be done, whatever that might be. That's all I'm doing is portraying a mindset, portraying a heart attitude that recognizes that what is most valuable and most important and most cherished, for some reason, whatever the reason, is going to be brought to an end. And there's a, there is just like, I just do not want to do this. And when that is built into our thinking early on in marriage, then we can expect to see the demise, the diminishing, and the subsiding of divorce because it's a, it's a hatred for it because of its counterpart, 
It's supreme, the supremacy of marriage. So I leave you for those thoughts. And for self-examination, you think it through. Am I, do I have a righteous jealousy for the grand picture? Do I have a righteous jealousy for the sacred union? Do I have a righteous jealousy for the purity of the church? These are the kind of jealousies that God wants us to have, and in those we are bent on protecting and maintaining and keeping this high view of marriage like Jesus gave to the disciples. It's meant to be a good thing, but it's meant to be a permanent. Are we going to invest our lives and our energies and to build, sustain, promote, enhance marriage relationships like God does with us? Because when you do that, you're sending a message. God so loved us, grace, forgiveness, patience, and I want the rest of the world to see it. So our Father, whatever our history may have been, wherever our course, our plans are for the future, I pray that you would give to us that kind of passion for the sacredness, the grandness, the magnificence of marriage. Because it's, it gives such a beautiful portrait of how much you loved us and your son, Jesus Christ, paid the dowry for us as his bride by his own blood. Cleansed of us all in righteousness and gives us his righteousness so that we can be of, of one mind and share the throne of glory with his heavenly Father. So thank you, Father, for that. And now might we build our marriages with that in the background. Enjoy its blessedness but for better and higher reasons. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.